is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 224 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Anna Cake, and we're talking all about author branding, which apparently is hard for me to say. But first to the comments. So lots and lots of comments on JP's episode. Lavis said, just listened, and it was fantastic. Came at just the right time because I'm having an inkling that something isn't quite right in my outline. So now I'm going to try out this method and see if it helps make things clearer. Holger agreed and said, what a wonderful episode and I loved the concept, super great. Liz Lincoln said, you're absolutely right, JP. Maslow is full of shit. (laughs) I say this as a trained therapist who studied the fuck out of his whole hierarchy. Like so much Western psychology, he's a wealthy white dude who decided he was right and therefore he's right. Uh, And I hate that it gets treated like gospel in my field. Herman, uh, sorry, Herman Marianson? No, Marian Hermanson said, what a fabulous episode. Got to disagree with you though, Sasha. You said that the exercise with JP uh, was talking about was horrific. I think it's one of the most valuable exercises you can do in your life is reframing what's most important. Most of the time we all say to ourselves, I'd love to do this, but I don't have time because, insert blah, blah, blah. But we can't write because of your job means every day you're choosing your job over your writing. Okay, so yes, I know what you're saying. I think it was more of a like, oh my God, this is horrific because it's going to um, shed light on all of the things that you need to change and do. Rather than horrific meaning bad, I kind of meant like horrific good. I know that's a complete uh, <laughs> like opposite, but hey, British slang sometimes is a bit weird. Um, SL Hansen book said, ha ha ha, I felt your, I make all the plans and never re- revisit them. So, comment so hard, Sasha. Every damn year. And then AMAC Uh, descendant said this was a great episode but you never asked the question that burned in my heart that was how does being the ninth person in your family line with the exact same name make you feel what is the history behind that name do you have a jp the (laughs) 10th um uh so yeah jp if you are listening and you can let us know (laughs) (laughs) That would be great. So in personal news and updates then, the TikTok boom is still continuing. It is a bit of a wonder to me. Uh, But as I record this on January 5th, which is a Friday, I've just passed 11,000 followers on TikTok. And the video, the first video that went sort of micro viral has surpassed 500,000 views, which is just bananas to me um and the consequences of that and and sort of the increase in income has just been staggering i <laughs> i get a little bit nervous when i talk about it because it's it's just so shocking and um yeah i don't, i don't even really know what to say what i will say is tiktok is is still alive and kicking and can still change lives let me put it that way um So this next week, I am continuing to TikTok. I'm sort of doing a bit more stats and analysis um, uh, of it and making sure that I am trying to post things that will, you know, elicit the highest response and and highest amount of views. Um, Listen, I'm not going to give advice on TikTok. I'm not the best person to do that. Uh, I know that Adam Beswick, who um, coached me, is uh, has just started a new Facebook. So um, I'd definitely go and check that out. I can leave a link to that in the show notes. Um, And I believe he might be doing some coaching or something um, at some point as well. So you'll have to have a look at that as well. So in other news then, I was meant to be editing this week, but of course my son only went back to school yesterday on Thursday the 4th. And so it's just been a bit of a chaotic week really. I haven't got done what I needed to get done. So um, today is an admin day for me. I'm going to clear the decks. I literally have a to-do list. That is so painfully long. I can't even begin to describe to you how many fucking things are on this to-do list. Um, But yes, I'm going to get everything done. And then next week, I won't have to make a single decision and I will just focus on editing. Then I'm going to send it to a fast reader um, to turn it around really quickly because I really want to capitalize on 
the TikTok boom. If I can, um, so essentially I had made the decision to publish in March instead of February. But when I tried to redo my calendar, I was just like, no, I don't want to do this because I'm going to lose the gift that I was given from TikTok. So I now I'm sort of changing things just for this series so that I can get it out a bit quicker and try and keep the like increased, um, what's the word? Awareness? I don't know. Like, visibility traction traction like the increased traction um by having another release as quick as possible so um next week is going to be a flurry of editing and um hopefully by the time i record this next i should be a good chunk of the way through the book in other news then um i am going to be giving the keynote and teaching some sessions and being on a panel at the romance writers of new zealand conference in new zealand <laughs> funnily enough in christchurch uh 9th to the 11th of August. So if you are that way, um, I do believe that they will release tickets in February. So uh, when I have more information on that, I will let you know. I'm also going to be in Seville this year at the 20 Books Seville. I'm going to be at London Book Fair and SPS as well, I think. Um, so, uh, oh, and Stockholm Writers Festival. So those are the sort of five places that I'm going to be this year if you care to join me. But if you can't do the traveling, then I do have a another option. You can join me for my very first live webinar, Pros in the Market. So I am running three session times to try and accommodate, accommodate as many time zones as possible. Writing to market isn't new, but when teachers talk about it, typically they focus on understanding the market itself, the advertising, the brand and the pitch. But what about the writing and craft of writing to market? If you're tired of trying to work out how to deliver what readers want, then this is the workshop for you. In the session, I will explain how to deconstruct best-selling books and implement the tools you find. I will give you an easy three-step method uh, for deconstruction. I'll give you lots of practical examples of deconstruction and implementation in your own work. I will explain why you're not using copywriting enough. I'll also show you how to intentionally slip TikTokable marketable scenes into your novels. And I've just decided to add another section where I'm going to show you a couple of my sex scenes from some of my books and how I convert that into TikTok hooks. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the craft of tropes and I'll give you lots and lots of um, examples during the session and even try and do some live ones that you give me live in the session. There is also a whole Q&A section so you can ask me questions live and in person. Uh, and last but by no means least, there'll be a little workbook that will contain exercises that, that you can do, you can go away and do after the session. So if you think this sounds interesting, then I will leave links in the show notes and you can check it out. The other last thing that I will say is that there are limited places and I won't be selling this um, after the fact. You'll only get the recording if you turn up to the event. Let me correct myself. You'll only get the recording if you buy a ticket. So if you buy a ticket but you can't actually attend live, that's fine. You will get the recording. Last but by no means least, my audiobook uh, for a girl... A Game of Hearts and Heist has finally released. I'm super excited by this. The narrators are fucking epic. So what I'm going to do is at the end of this episode, I'm going to leave a little clip. So if you're interested in hearing um, a little snippet of the audiobook, then I will leave that at the end of the episode. Please do go and check it out. I am so, so proud of this audiobook. Podium did a fucking amazing job. The Rebel of the Week this week is Holger's dog, Baloo. So, Baloo says, Trainers often say that at 10 weeks old, a puppy like me should be completely attached to its family, never straying too far for safety. Yet, at 12 weeks old, I embarked on a solo adventure into the nearby forest. Oh, the joy I felt when my family found me an hour later. People compare me to a squirrel. All, it, all ears, all energy, never focused. But that's just the side I show to the world. At home, I'm the opposite. I curl up in my bed and sleep all day, recharging for my next escapade. I need that rest to keep up my antics, especially to pester my dad during our walks. That's an important job, right? They also say uh, dogs will do anything for treats. But you know what? What uh, The world beyond our home is so captivating that treats are just an afterthought. My passion is exploration and I seize every chance to sneak away. You can bet on that. 
Now, as a six-year-old grown-up dog, I still revel in acting like a puppy. It's hilarious when people use that high-pitched voice to talk to me, asking my dad if I'm barely a year old. Their surprised faces are the best. My aim in life to continually astonish humans with my exuberant tail-wagging attitude, always leaving them uh, bewildered about what goes on in my mind. A few years ago, I hatched a brilliant plan. For weeks, I played the role of obedient dog following commands, responding to recalls, all to earn the freedom (laughs) of being off leash. (laughs) And when that moment came... (laughs) During a play session with another dog, I seized it. I bolted into the wilderness for the best of two hours of exploration. When I finally saw Dad again, he was drenched in sweat. But, oh, I was overjoyed to see him, even if it took him a while to catch up. (laughs) Oh, my God. This is so sweet. I love this rebellion so much. Um... Thank you to everybody who has um, sent in uh, Rebel Stories. We've had a couple in. We're still really low, though. So if you do have a Rebel Story, I would be very, very grateful if you would send it in. Uh, you, It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, something in between. It doesn't even have to be a human rebellion. You can email your Rebel Story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to new and up, upped patrons, Heather Button and Nicole Hutton. Uh, and of course, a huge thank you to all of my existing patrons. If you would like to get access to all of the episodes early, as well as bonus content like discounts for my webinar, um, access to the well in excess of 100 strong uh, Slack community group, the Poison and Prose sessions where we write in sprints and I answer Q&As, the movie nights, we've got a movie night coming up the master classes and the next master class is looking at what it takes to get to Amazon number one where we will deconstruct uh, two authors an indie author and a trad author looking at their craft their books their tropes their platform their marketing all of that good stuff in between um, so you can from as little, from as little as two dollars a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black Hey, that is it from me this week. Let's get on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Anna Keg. Anna trains creative people to do their own marketing. She works with the Society of Authors, Jericho Writers and the Literary Consultancy, as well as one-to-one with many writers. She's worked in communications for over 20 years, specializing in media relations and strategic marketing campaigns and is an experienced and engaging public speaker. Anna also writes historical crime fiction, and her debut novel novel was shortlisted for the CWA Debut Dagger Prize. She reviews books for the Sheffield Telegraph and on her blog. The former head of communications at Sheffield City Council, uh uh-huh, we're going to have some shared experiences, (laughs) and tutor on the University of Sheffield MA Journalism course, Anna began her training business to support writers to build their brand and reach more readers. She now works with traditionally indie and self-published writers, as well as helping creatives in any discipline uh, find a wider audience. Hello and welcome. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, Sasha. It's lovely to be here. No, you're most welcome. This is going to be a very interesting chat. So you worked in um, the public sector. So let me... I did. (laughs) That sounds like the voice of experience, did you? Oh, it really, really is. (laughs) (laughs) That could be a whole conversation in itself. I know, right? (laughs) So was Sheffield Conservative or Labour? When I first started working for Sheffield Council, it was Lib Dem. Um, so oh, Lib Dem oh yes. For, ooh, maybe a year or two, and then it became Labour for most yeah, of that the was, time I worked there. That was Mr Clegg's fault for voting for the tuition fee cap to come off, right? Because I was president <laughs> of my students' union at that time, and I took busloads of students to London to protest. Like, we were that year. Of, were you of at Sheffield stu- Union? No, no, I was oh, at Hertfordshire. Right. But all okay. of our students had voted Lib Dem because of the promise not to take the tuition fee off. Now, this is going to be really boring for everybody listening because it's not <laughs> so with writing, and it's very political. So I'm going to I'm going to change the subject. The point is, I 
um, nearly went into politics and then I diverted and went and became, well, not really a civil servant because I wasn't in London, but I worked for Hertfordshire County Council. Um, Yeah, so that was a fun time, but they were a very conservative council. They have been conservative since the dawn of time. So that was um, interesting. And I did that for eight years and then I left and now I'm happy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh dear anyway <laughs> yeah exactly um, but would you let, before we dive into the topic of kind of marketing and communications and strategy and all of that stuff would you like to tell everyone a little bit about you and sort of how you got to where you are today yeah well I mean we've touched on it there to be honest so I have really worked in communications and marketing all my career. So since I first got a sort of proper sensible job, that's been what I've um, done. Um, and But I've always written as well. And, and for a very long time, I don't know if you found this, those two worlds were quite separate. So I had my kind of professional life, which was marketing and comms in the, started in the voluntary sector and then moved into the public sector. Um, and you know reading and then increasingly writing was becoming a really important part of my life and then I had this kind of moment of epiphany really about it's nearly four years ago now where my writing um I wasn't having any success to speak of in fact it was a it was a bit of a roller coaster of sort of failure and rejection which I know a lot of writers will will relate to but I think I'd come to my own realisation that that was the most important thing in the world to me and that I really needed to be able to give more time and energy and headspace to that. And at the time I was the head of comms in Sheffield and that was the job where I had no free time and even less free headspace. So I thought, right, what I'd love to do here is kind of combine my professional knowledge and expertise in comms with the world I love to be in, which is the world of writing. Um, I wonder if there's a bit of a gap in the market for teaching writers how to do this for themselves. Um, So yeah, that was really sort of, (laughs) yes. (laughs) At the time it was a bit of a punt. It was genuinely really scary because at the time when I um, handed my notice in, um, I was I had a three month notice period and a month into that notice period was when the first COVID lockdown happened. So I was sort of thinking, OK, I'm going to be training people. And initially, I think I was thinking, you know, quite old school to train people. You have to be in the same room as them. Um, <laughs> and then suddenly you can't be in the same room as anyone. And I'm like, oh, my God. Um And plus, I just wasn't sure if there was going to be the demand for it. So it was a really scary time, but I just knew it was it was the right direction for me to take. And initially, I was sort of expecting the business to be a bit of a side hustle, to be honest. I was really hoping that my own writing would take off and the business would be a side hustle to help pay the mortgage. Um, (laughs) The the way it's worked out is the business has just flown. That's gone brilliantly. Um, And, you know, I'm still plugging away at my writing. That's still one of the most important things um, in my life to me. Um, But, yeah, the the business has, has done really well. Amazing. I think so many authors struggle. With, yeah. Like the marketing side, the communication side, the talking about absolutely. themselves side. Yeah, I just absolutely. think it is this like global problem for most writers. So let's maybe talk about that and talk about like, what do you think are kind of the big mistakes that writers make? Like what, what do you see them struggling with or, or why are they making these mistakes? Yeah. Let's maybe start there. Yeah, I think there's a few different ways to answer that question, actually. So a couple of the of the kind of big mistakes or big misconceptions that I see out there that are actually hopefully quite straightforward to to um, well, maybe straightforward to be aware of a little bit more complicated to address. But the first one is trying to appeal to too many people. Um, So I think that and, and this is actually one of the biggest mistakes that people make in marketing across any sector this is not unique to authors at all and you ask people who their audience is and they'll say oh it's everyone everyone should read my book everyone should be interested in my product everyone should and actually what you do as you know when you go out into the world and try and appeal to everybody is you're really really bland and boring and you appeal to nobody 
So it's much, much more effective to be very clear about who are the groups of people that I can talk to here, who I can give them a real reason, a genuine reason why they're going to be interested in my writing and then really tailor all your marketing to appeal to those groups of people. Um, So, you know, that can feel a little bit counterintuitive, I think, initially, you know, saying actually really focus and find your niche or niches in terms of who's going to be interested in your work. People think they're limiting themselves in terms of sales and in terms of marketing, but actually you're you're much more likely um, to be effective if you do that. Yeah, there, there's that phrase niche down to rich up. Yes. Um. Okay. I'm trying to prevent myself from sneezing here. Um, <laughs> let's let's talk about you. You sort of mentioned you know uh, really honing your message and talking to that particular narrow audience. So let, let's talk about that. Where do we start when we want to create a marketing strategy or a communications plan for our books? Like what are even the elements that make up a community? You know, because I just like chuck shit out on social media, you know, <laughs> like, what am I doing wrong here? Like what are the sections I should be writing or planning um, in, in, a, in a plan? <laughs> I know. When you tell people, when I say to people, oh, I'm a real advocate for marketing strategy, you can sort of see people kind of dropping off and snoozing and and you know it does feel very dry and very unsexy um but really all that means is being clear about who your audiences are so the first thing to do is uh well the first thing to do is is decide what success looks like for you loads of sounds, fucking money <laughs> yeah <laughs> nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with your objective being all about sales and income um for a lot of writers it'll be um you know encouraging signups to your mailing list that's a really good objective for, for a marketing strategy for lots of writers but it's amazing how often people you sort of say you know why are you doing this why are you spending a load of time on tiktok why are you spending a load of time sending out emails And they're not really sure they kind of doing it because they feel like they should or because they feel like they have to. So the first thing is, okay. what does success look like if this all works? What is going to be different in six months? What's going to be different in a year? But then the next thing, and and I would argue potentially the most important part of your marketing strategy is being really clear about who your readers are. So who are the people who. I'm confident that if I get information about this book in front of these people, I can give them a reason why they're going to sit up, pay attention and want to go out and buy it. So you can do that in a whole range of different ways relating to, you know, the setting of your book, the content of your book, the things that people spend time doing in your book through to kind of factors relating to you as an author, you know, where you live and work, your professional background. Um, But just spending that time thinking, okay, who are my readers? Where are my readers? And then how can I talk to them? Um, And then it's just a case of thinking, right, okay, what are my options for reaching them, finding them and talking to them? And then what are the messages and the content that are going to make them sit up and pay attention and take the action I want them to take? So let's talk a little bit, let's go into a bit more detail about that. So there are a lot of authors putting stuff on social media and it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily generating the results that they want. So, and I am kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you have an example (laughs) of like maybe a social media message that would be ineffective versus how do we, you mentioned like, how do we talk to readers? Well, how do we do that? What are kind of the words and phrases or like what's the the language that we should be using in order to communicate effectively? Yeah, so it will vary depending on your audiences and and kind of understanding and knowing your audiences is key. It will also vary depending on the channel, but being specific to social media, I would say a really good rule of thumb um, when you are sharing content on social media is people go on social media to talk about themselves. They don't go on social media to talk about you and your books. So if you want to get social media algorithms liking you and showing your content to more people, the best way to do that is to be starting conversations. So most social media algorithms really love comments above almost anything else. 
So really thinking about, okay, how can I start conversations that are linked to my book, you know, that maybe tangentially or, or not tangentially, maybe really, you know, directly link back to my book. But what does it mean to be a reader of my books? There's a, an exercise I do with um, some of my clients around kind of really what what does it mean? What if you read a particular book, what are you saying about yourself? What do you care about? What are you interested in? What are your values? What are you and also, you know, your like really petty preoccupations. What do you know about your readers and how can you um, ask questions and start conversations on social media that will then get people talking? Um, because that is the key to being effective on social media is not going back to like old school kind of broadcast comms. You know, here's some information about me and my book. Um, it, it's thinking, OK, how can I use that as a jumping off point to get that dialogue going and to get that back and forth going? Um, yeah. And that's the sort of that's the sort of message I'd really be encouraging people to think about on social media, particularly. Mm, OK, I'm trying to think about like how I would do that with my specific um, readers. And maybe there's like particular topics that are like unique to my audience I'm not sure I'll have to think about that that's a that's a yeah that's food for thought yeah no exactly it's like what do I know and you'll you'll know your audience really well you know you'll know your readers really well and just from you know okay what gets them chatting when you share particular sorts of information what are the what are the kind of tweets what are the posts what are the kind of stories that get them you know, responding and answering and saying, oh, actually, Sasha, this is what I think about that, you know, and just learning as you go. That is the, you know, another really good piece of advice for, for social media, as you know, the not only do the algorithms change all the time, um, but, you know, you need to be on there as a user, first and foremost, kind of responding to what is working on there and responding to the conversations that people are having. So constantly learning from your audience is, is a really good rule of thumb as well. So at this time of year, in like the final quarter of the year, my my brain is one of these ones that likes to already be in next year. So I'm kind of like starting to do my planning for 2024. What are some key actions or elements that I could include in my marketing for next year that would really set me up well or help to grow what I've already got? Oh, OK. Um Okay, so I think there's a couple of things here. So one of the things, like from a really practical perspective that you could go away and do on almost any channel, actually, um, is really explore video content if you're not doing that already. So I would say that to anyone who, and actually for some writers, the idea of putting themselves on video content just makes them want to like hide behind the sofa. And that's fine too. You know, I'm, I'm not the sort of person who's ever going to tell anyone to do anything that makes them want to cringe and, and run away. But there's a lot of evidence that faces get better engagement than any other sort of content and algorithms love video content. So I think if that's not something you know, if there's a writer out there who's who's not already having a go with video or experimenting with video, that is something that I would really um, encourage people to have a go at and find a way that works for you, um, that you can kind of integrate into your daily or your weekly routine that, you know, most writers are really, really busy people. Your priority is writing your books, not marketing your books. And most writers, you know, a lot of writers have got a day job as well. So really think about, okay, how can I integrate that video creation into what I'm doing anyway so you don't have to sort of set aside a load of time to do that um the other thing I think is going to be increasingly important for 2024 is um prioritizing your channels so picking like one or two channels where you're really going to focus your time so this is again the case for marketing across the board I think there's a real um increasing awareness of the danger of burnout and particularly as you know Twitter now X turns into this really sort of unreliable channel where 
previously that was where a lot of kind of publishing related comms and social media was focused and and there still isn't one clear kind of replacement for that there are an awful lot of different places where people maybe feel like you should be um but it's not possible to be everywhere and so another thing that I would really encourage people to do is is just pick a few channels you know maybe even one or two platforms where you enjoy spending time and where you know your audiences hang out really focus your time on getting to know that platform building your community finding your people on that platform rather than feeling like you have to spread yourself too thinly and be everywhere because I think there is a lot of awareness now that you know trying to do too many things is just causing everyone to burn out which is really unsustainable um and also I think it always shines through in what you share I think if you're feeling enthusiastic and energized that really comes across in your content I think if you're feeling a bit knackered and like you're trying to fit too many things in you know that's not going to be as engaging yeah I think that's very true I know that um I love doing stories like Instagram stories but I know the minute that I get overwhelmed they stop so I know like I haven't had a story on there for like a week and it's just because I've had so much going on um okay so you you've mentioned like the fact that people go on social media to talk about themselves what are some other ways to like boost engagement um so it depends on the platform so generally so for example with instagram what instagram really likes at the moment is um as we've said first and foremost kind of starting conversation starting dialogue but also it really likes it when people use a variety of different sorts of content so you know if you are up for yes sharing posts on your grid but also sharing stories and then doing the odd reel as well and then doing um the odd live if that's something that you're happy to do that is when the algorithm will really say okay you know all any social media platform wants as you know is to keep people on that platform for as long as possible <laughs> so if it's kind of looking at your account and thinking right this account is helping me keep people on this platform for longer through a real variety of interesting content um then then it's going to give you a boost and it's going to show you to more people um the other thing i'd say though relating to that actually because i know what i don't want is for people to be listening to this thinking oh god that just feels really overwhelming that feels like too much um and another really lovely tip actually particularly for social media, but but I do think for marketing across the board is don't, you know, don't feel that you have to be sort of super shiny and polished and professional and perfect to go out there into the world with this content. You know, sometimes there is evidence that being less polished can be more engaging because you're more human and more real. So when I'm saying, you know, have a go, have a play, try all these different sorts of content, you know, spend time on a platform as a user getting to know, you know, okay, what's new with stories? What's new with reels? Don't feel like you have to be all kind of shiny and jazz hands and perfect before you can share content content relating to that particular part of the platform. Um, it's fine to, to, to kind of be learning and share that journey with your followers. Yeah, I think that's especially true of TikTok. TikTok is just a yes. hotbed of hot mess everything (laughs) everybody's like doing their makeup on there and like got their hair and the going out it's like back when I was a teenager and if it was like a Friday everybody would go out with like rollers in their hair like to (laughs) because they were just and like there were no fucks given at that point um yeah I feel like TikTok is very much that okay it's that behind the scenes stuff isn't it it's like being real I think you know, I know that there are a lot more kind of demographic groups using TikTok now, but the, you know, the the generation that predominantly use t- uses TikTok and started, you know, the TikTok revolution is, I mean, God, that generation can sniff inauthenticity a mile off, can't they? So, you know, just being real, I think, gets you a long way on platforms like that. Hundred percent agree. Let's move on to branding branding is like this super intangible thing and I think (laughs) when you're brand new to this world you often go oh yeah branding right I need to pick my colors yeah yeah but that's not really (laughs) branding is it (laughs) so could you maybe like define for listeners 
what is branding and how the fuck do we come up with it? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that is absolutely true. And what a lot of people say is, you know, oh, God, you're going to make me, you know, into Coca-Cola or Apple or something really sort of corporate and, and, and polished. And that's not what that's not what we mean by author branding at all. So, you know, you're absolutely right. There are as many different definitions of brand out there as you'd care to look for. But um, there's a couple I really like that I think are quite helpful. So one I use is it's the version of you that you will share with the public and potential readers. So it's you. It's real. It is authentic, but it's not all of you. You know, a lot of the branding work that I do with with writers is about, OK, let's do a really lovely deep dive into, you know, what your creative motivations and inspirations are, where your writing comes from, you know, what are you passionate about? What what are the, you know, of all the things that you could spend your time doing and spend your life doing, why is it writing these books? Um, and that's where this lovely sort of raw material that's going to make you stand out, enable you to demonstrate how you're different from all the other hundreds and thousands of other writers out there. But then it's about, okay, what am I happy and comfortable sharing with the public? A lot of writers, you know, will draw on like difficult or challenging or just, you know, private personal events or experiences in their own life, in their writing. And, and just because you do that doesn't mean you're under any obligation to then share that in a really sort of raw first person way with, with your potential readers. It's Branding is often as much about what you leave out as what you what you include. But yeah, so I think it's the version of you that you're going to share with your potential readers to invite them into the world of your of your work. OK, so now we understand what it is. Do you have any <laughs> like tips or advice for, to like help newer authors or even older? Not I don't want to say the word old, but, you know, more established authors to find their voice, their style, their brand, to just kind of hone it and define it. Yeah, definitely. I think a really good rule of thumb is don't try and replicate what other people are doing. That's probably another um sort of not mistake because I think it's really understandable why people do that but there's an awful lot in book marketing of okay what what's working well for other people and can I replicate that um when actually particularly with branding particularly deciding on you know what are the things I'm going to talk about in my marketing what are the subjects I'm going to explore what are the topics I'm going to include in the emails that I send to my mailing list the more you can embrace what makes you different, what makes you weird, what are the things that, you know, only you could talk about, the better. And, and the writers that really excel at this stuff are the writers who really find a way of, of being themselves um, in a kind of, you know, not in a completely sort of chaotic willy-nilly way they've kind of decided you know I, these are the things that I really love these are the things that really inspire me in my writing so this is what I'm going to talk about in my marketing to entice readers into the world of my work um, but where I see it work really really well is is where people absolutely embrace that and embrace what makes them different from others. I think it's a really hard one if we're not super self-aware like half of my brand came because my audience told me um and you know to be fair over the last couple of years I've done a lot of work on like myself and I've had loads of coaching and all the rest of it but it is I think a really difficult thing to be both it's almost like a juxtaposition to say it but like objectively introspective like yeah. that's what we're trying to do here in order to create this brand and I think like it's really That's such a good way of putting it. Yeah, well, I mean, that is kind of what we're yeah. be asking ourselves to do in creating our brand. And that's such a hard thing to do, to be inside yourself and outside yourself all, all at the same time. Um, yeah, and so what's interesting for me is that I have one very established brand, which is a Sasha Black. And then as I'm now writing a new, under a new pen name, under Ruby Row, um, that is a whole new genre and a whole new, I still feel like a fledgling author. And I'm like, I sort of know what I'm trying to do, but like, I don't know necessarily whether the brand is established yet. There are kind of like a few principles that I am adhering to, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. And 
if you've got more than one brand, it almost becomes trickier because you're like, which pieces am I separating out to have over here? And which am I separating to have over here? Um, yeah. In this day and age of like AI, which is a hugely hot and controversial topic, how can we lean into our brand to make ourselves even more human? Like, are there any things that we can do to like really solidify that kind of the usness? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I love what you just said, actually. I think that's such a good way of thinking about it. And it's maybe a lot of the um, exercises that I use with writers to explore their branding are play exercises. And it's kind of been trial and error over the years that I've tried various sort of um, techniques to really get writers to uncover that raw material and uncover that real sort of... um, exploratory kind of look at where their writing comes from um and i found that kind of doing this is like a really nice interview play exercise that i use and i think that that you've just hit the nail on the head in terms of why that works because play enables you to sort of be both outside yourself and inside yourself at the same time doesn't it so yeah that is really really interesting um and maybe that kind of starts to answer the AI question as well. I think, um, I don't know about you, I'm one of these people that depending on the day, I'm either really excited about AI or completely terrified. I watched Terminator far too much as a child, so kind of be chill about this, to be honest. <laughs> I think that it's a very controversial topic, and I think that everybody is entitled to however they feel. For me, I'm trying not to really even look at it. Like I'm using the tools that work for me and I'm leaving the tools that don't. Um, But what I'm trying to maintain faith in is me. And by that, I mean, I have faith that I can pivot. I have faith that if something goes wrong, I'll find a solution. I have faith that, I don't know, even, you know... because the thing is, is even if AIs are writing these books, they still need to be marketed. They still need to yeah. be sold, you yeah. know, and that's a whole different. And I'm not saying that they won't be able to do that. I'm sure, you know, God, give it three days and they probably can. But, you know, <laughs> the point is, is that I have faith in myself to constantly yeah. pivot and be OK. Yeah. And I think if we can redirect that energy, that nervous energy back in, in terms of like, driving us forward to keep taking action and turn that kind of agitation into action I think that is how we overcome this as a creative industry I think we have to like be brave and have faith in ourselves and just keep trying to learn and grow um but yeah sure I know that not everybody agrees with me but I like to stay positive (laughs) yeah well I think that sounds like a really healthy attitude to it and I think actually that speaks to a lot of you know, the approach that I'd recommend in terms of marketing as well. Marketing is not, I used to work, um, you'll kind of have experienced this if you've worked in the public sector as well, particularly when I first started working in um, public sector comms, you come up against people who, you know, learned how to do marketing, um, maybe like 50 years ago or something, or even 30 years ago or um And then they just think that they can replicate that and do that for the rest of their career and it will be effective. And as you know, if you're going to be good at marketing um, and good at at communications, you have to build into that constant learning and development. I mean, this is my background. This is my profession. This is what I'm confident that I'm good at. You know, I will still build in every year, making sure I do at least two or three different courses to make sure that my skills and my knowledge are completely up to date. So I think the idea that you learn how to do marketing and then just do that forevermore, you know, is really, really misplaced. And you're going to soon find yourself coming unstuck probably within, you know, a a matter of months. So what I would say with AI and why I think, you know, the attitude that you're describing is really healthy is, you know, we just have to kind of continually learn. We have to 
try not to be as you know daunted and continually learn what tools this might bring that we're comfortable using um and and then be fully aware that actually next month in six months time we'll have to learn a whole new set of of stuff relating to this and and that's okay because that's the case with it with a lot of different areas and a lot of different channels in this work um i do think in terms of embracing your humanity you know kind of going back to what we were saying before really sometimes sharing your flaws sometimes sharing your weaknesses if that's something that you're comfortable doing can be amongst the most powerful and most effective elements of an author brand um I can give you an example of that if that's helpful like what I mean by that so I worked with a a writer once a really brilliant writer and she suffered with a really severe anxiety disorder and in our first session together she was kind of saying I don't I don't know if I can do this I don't know if marketing is good is that even something that I can do because my anxiety is is really crippling sometimes um but she was very comfortable being open about Uh, being somebody who has an anxiety disorder and the impact that that has on her life and we kind of explored that and we talked about it and we explored what she was comfortable saying around that and and that ended up being one of the most engaging interesting parts of her author brand that she shared publicly was what's it like being a writer with an anxiety disorder how does that affect my writing both in in negative and I have to say positive ways Um, and something that she'd initially thought, oh my God, this is really going to get in the way of me marketing effectively ended up being absolutely without a doubt, one of her biggest strengths when it came to marketing. So, you know, embracing your flaws, embracing your weaknesses, but doing so in a way that you've, you know, you're, you're confident that you are going to be comfortable doing that. You're not going to be straying into areas that afterwards you'll think, Oh God, I wish I hadn't talked about that um I think embracing that is is a real strength yeah definitely I love that and as soon as you started talking I was like oh I don't know where this story's going (laughs) (laughs) there's just something about that level of authenticity and almost like shame sharing like you know Brene Brown talks about like when you share shame it just around it eviscerates it um so yeah I love that Do you, so I sort of asked you about some mistakes earlier, but anything specific that you can think of that you see authors do on social media, anything that we shouldn't be doing or we should give up for 2024? Um, I mean, I suppose what I do see a lot of, and I don't really blame people for this because no one's got any time, have they? But it's doing that very sort of broadcasty message type message. And by that, I mean, like, you're not asking any questions. You're not expecting anything back. You're just saying you know this is the day my book is out and you're not starting a conversation at all for example um and I think it's really obvious when people have kind of got themselves set up on a load of different channels and they've just stuck the same post on Facebook and as on Instagram as on um Twitter or X as on you know every other platform and I think that what you unless you're really really well established already and even then it's not best practice it's not a good idea um but you'll just get tumbleweed and you'll just get nothing back and then the algorithm you know as well as looking at your performance on that individual post it will look at previous posts so if you send out a load of boring content that nobody responds to and nobody's interested in then that's going to affect everything that you share for a little while after that so I think, you know, really trying to think about when you're sharing, oh, bless you, when you're sharing content on social media um, and thinking about, okay, what am I asking as well as just, you know, I've I've got some information to share, so I'm just going to shove it out into the world and hope for the best. You know, I think it is completely understandable why people do that when they have limited time, but it really isn't effective. How can we get rid of the ick factor of talking about ourselves and our work? That is such a good question. That's one of the questions I get asked by writers almost more than any other is that idea of, um, you know, like, oh, it's just it's showing off, isn't it? And we're all taught that like showing off is bad and, you know, taking up people's time and space and attention is bad. And I think to a certain extent, there are ways around that. So um, there are a few sort of tricks 
um, that can get a, around that idea of blowing your own trumpet that I know a lot of writers feel really uncomfortable with. So a few really nice ideas to get around that are talk about your subject matter and why it inspires you. So why do you write about the things that you write about? You know, because presumably if you're spending months and years of your life writing about this thing, it's because you're passionate about it and you love it. And in some way it sets your world on fire. So saying I'm really inspired by this, you know, and this is why um, it motivates me and excites me and why I'm passionate about this subject matter you know, you're implicitly within that kind of saying, OK, my book is really interesting and fascinating. And if you're interested in this subject, then you're going to love it. But you're not quite so explicitly saying, OK, here's my book. It's brilliant. Um, the other really lovely tip, actually, um, which you're really good at and a lot of writers are really, really good at, is that idea of kind of amplifying and supporting and collaborating with others. Um, you know, as you know, all the evidence says that most people who buy books buy a lot of books. So if there's any writers out there who are nursing any kind of secret feelings that other writers are their competition, you know, it's time to get rid of that once and for all. The more that you can kind of collaborate with and support and amplify what other people are doing, especially where you've got some really lovely audience crossover. It's a really nice thing to do in itself, but you'll also often end up with really lovely sort of collaborations and reciprocal arrangements going on that can just make things feel a bit more natural. You're not just blowing your own trumpet, you're blowing someone else's as well. <coughs> are there like any authors doing like that you see doing anything interesting or any like real standout stars that we could like maybe go and view their profiles or go and see what they're doing to kind of be inspired for our own uh brand and and social media marketing yeah absolutely <laughs> sorry I think we've gone from horse and interesting to snotty and disgusting in the last <clears throat> oh dear sorry um so yeah, some some writers that I would really recommend. Um, and, and when I kind of give examples, I would always encourage you to think, OK, what would the equivalent of this look like for me? It's never a good idea to just kind of go and look at what other people are doing and and try and replicate that. But there's some people that I just think are brilliant in the way that they market their work. So the first example and someone I use an awful lot um, is the is the writer Claire McIntosh, who predominantly writes crime fiction, um, although she's got a very different sort of book on grief coming up soon. Um, and she is really, really creative. She's always trying new things. She's always trying to um, do things a little bit differently with her book marketing. Um, she's really savvy about who her audiences are and who her audiences are going to be for different books. So there's a lot of really lovely marketing, actually, that she's been doing around this upcoming book about grief that is very, very different from what she does around her crime books and really demonstrates that understanding that the audience is going to be slightly different here. Um, so I would, yeah, Claire McIntosh is my absolute gold standard. Um, there's a couple of others. Someone else I really love, actually, is um, a much less well-known writer called Samantha Clark, who is a writer, but also a visual artist. And she's someone I use as an example a lot um, because all of the ideas, all of the like preconceived notions you might have about what marketing looks like and what using social media looks like, she's just thrown them away. And she has made it work for her. Um, she lives in Orkney. She lives by the sea. She's got her, a canoe that she made herself, you know, and she goes out on the water and her content is just so relaxing and it's a real kind of stop and breathe. And But it's also lovely and engaging. So she's a fabulous example. Again, not that I'd suggest people go and replicate what she's doing, but in terms of someone who perhaps you know, marketing didn't come particularly naturally to her, but she's found a way of really making it her own. I think she's a fabulous example. Um, are they both um, trad? Um, yes, they are. Yes, I think so. Yes, I think they both are. Yeah. Um, there's another writer I really love um, what she does on social media, and that's um, Nadine Matheson, who's another crime writer. 
Um, you can probably tell where my kind of first love in terms of genre is. Um, and one of the things I really love about what Nadine does is, is she goes back to what we were saying earlier before, actually, about... Um, you know integrating your content into what you're doing anyway she's phenomenally busy um she still works um training lawyers she's written a really successful series she's um really fantastic at doing her own marketing she's got a podcast so her content is kind of fit into these chunks of time that she finds like when she's doing a morning walk and things like that so just for a little bit of inspiration of how to um yeah, how to find ideas for content that aren't going to take you ages. I think she's a really lovely example. What differences do you see between trad authors and indie authors? Because the, all three of those were trad examples. Yeah, the yeah. majority of listeners are indie. Yeah. So, And I know that when I kind of look at, let's say, Instagram, the types of content that I see shared are different. I don't think I can, without going and examining and look at it kind of, tangibly give you what those differences are in a list right this second but it does feel like there are differences so like yeah. what like do you see any differences like are there kind of different strategies that we should be employing I don't think I think you're absolutely right that you will see different types of content I'm not convinced that increasingly I think the differences in terms of what's expected when it comes to marketing and promoting your own work, I think the difference between what's expected or certainly what's effective between trad and indie is, is closing all the time. And I think, as you know, you know, indie authors tend to be really ahead of the curve um, in terms of what's going to be effective and what's working and what's, you know, so in terms of building that really, sustainable long-term platform building that community around your work and those long-term relationships with writers I think a lot of indie authors are really savvy about that having said that I think increasingly traditionally published authors that's what they are starting to cotton on to in terms of you know this is what we really need to be doing as well um it's now about 50 50 in terms of the writers that I work with um, traditionally and indie or self-published. Um, I think m there are different expectations sometimes with traditionally published authors in terms of what they think. <laughs> they think their publisher will take care of and what will happen. And sometimes it's, if I'm honest, it, it, it can be a little bit of a kind of crash down to earth in terms of, oh, okay, a lot of this is on me um, that maybe wasn't their expectation. Um, but yeah, I would say that gap is definitely closing now in terms of what is going to work really well for you and and what is kind of needed really in, in terms of those two groups. Yeah, 100%. Okay, last question then before I ask you the ultimate podcast question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any Any final advice for like refining over time or maybe pivoting over time? Um, yeah, like any advice for sort of developing as you go? Yeah, definitely. I really loved what you said actually earlier and you said it in a really throwaway way, which was that you have learned so much from your readers. Um, and you kind of said it like you you don't get the credit because you've learned from your readers and you've listened to them. And actually that is one of the most important things to do is to listen both to, to what people are actually telling you, but just track what's working in terms of both, you know, analytics on your social media, which I know can get very, very seductive in terms of, okay, you know, what engagement am I getting? What, you know, how many comments am I getting? But also tracking that back to right has has this seen a, a spike in sales you know the things that really matter tracking that and learning from that um but listening listening to what people are telling you about what resonates with them about your work um you know what they love about your work what they say about your work to other people again one of the um one of the very first um, author branding exercises that I often get people to do is to um, ask them to describe their work from the perspective of their ideal reader. So what would your ideal reader say about your book to a friend? How would they explain what they love about this book to a friend? And as I'm sure you can guess, one of the main points of that exercise is to kick 
your inner critic out of the room and just really see your work again from that kind of internal external perspective um but yeah listen and learn and and always refine always refine don't you know i'm a big fan of a marketing strategy i love a plan i love kind of you know making sure that what you're going to do is going to be complementary over the next six months but i would always say you need to really review what's working well for you at least every six months and and learn from from what your readers have told you and what's been effective in the meantime yeah I love that I love that like thought experiment of what is it that you want your readers to say I definitely want my readers to say that they need a fan whilst they're reading my books (laughs) oh nice (laughs) have you ever sent out fans with like a no, but that is a fucking brilliant idea. And like, I literally, because I am going to do a book box next year um, and what, and I haven't it. really thought about what to do, put in it. But yeah, putting a fan in like, you, oh my God, that's a brilliant idea. Because like literally that, like I want people to buy the book like as a gift with a fan yeah, for yeah. somebody else. Like that is the-, you know, the other reason why that's so cool is because a really lovely trick is to get your readers to do your marketing for you. So, you know, again, Claire McIntosh is brilliant at this. She once did this kind of challenge for her readers to take a picture of her book with their pet. You know, again, people love sharing pictures of their cute pets on social media. So with your fan, you could then do some kind of share a picture of you with my book fanning yourself. And, you know, I'll share the ones I like the best. The ones I like the best will get some kind of prize, whatever you do with that. But then essentially they're, doing that job for you aren't they and saying you know oh I'm reading this book and I'm fanning myself and you know that's that's kind of giving your readers the tools to help you do your job for you is always a really nice trick yeah that's a that is a brilliant idea thank you I'm definitely gonna go investigate see I always think half the half the work that I do with writers is kind of giving them the framework but then also kind of asking the right questions because that absolutely came from you and you're like no what I want is my reader sitting there with a fan just going (laughs) you know so that's it's it's directly from kind of you and the impact that you want to have oh I love that that's given me lots of food for thought well this is the rebel author podcast so tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel oh (laughs) well this is a really I don't know. This is a really interesting question for me. I don't know how deep and meaningful you want me to go with this, but Uh, like, I, I, I kind of, I don't know if I was a rebel on purpose, but I've always been the sort of person who struggles with rules and struggles with authority. (laughs) I, and yet really you worked like, in the public sector. I know. <laughs> and then I was squashed for 11 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I had a really sort of troubled time growing up. And, you know, it, it wasn't easy. And I don't know if that was because I was kind of, as I say, rebelling on purpose, or it was just this kind of part of my character, which is I won't, you know, accept what I'm told. I will always sort of apply critical independent thought and decide you know and and that got me into a lot of trouble for a lot of years and and it's still you know that is still a fundamental part of who I am but I think it's really interesting for me I think as I've got older it's almost like I've realized I don't have to rebel if that makes sense like just because two roads diverge in a wood I don't always have to take the one less traveled by sometimes I can just take the really lovely paved road and just you know take it steady for a little while so I think kind of my relationship to rebelliousness has been a real a really sort of interesting one over the years um but certainly something I'm really proud of and something that I would consider you know quite rebellious was when I left my very stable, very secure, very well-paid um, head of comms job, which was really like by all sort of external measures of success. You know, it was doing all the things that you're supposed to want with your life. Um, and I just realised that that wasn't what I wanted. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it at all. There were a lot of things about that job that I actually really, really loved. Um, but I just realised there were other things that were much more important to me my writing and working with writers um and I could I I just couldn't do them all so I left that job 
and a lot of people thought I was absolutely insane. Um, that was a choice that made no sense to an awful lot of people. Um, but it was the right choice for me. And, you know, we're nearly four years down the line and it's not been an easy, <laughs> particularly with my own writing. It's not been an easy um, road to have gone down, but there is no doubt in my mind that it was the right choice for me. So, yeah, I'm really I'm really proud of that choice. Um, definitely. I love it. We left at similar points. I left in uh, I think day one on my own was May the 1st, 2019. So oh, wow. you left not long after me. Yeah. 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 And have you ever had a have you ever had a day's doubt that it was the right <laughs> choice for you? No. <laughs> not not <laughs> one millisecond. Has it been a bed of roses? No. Are there some months where I am like rolling in cash and other months where I'm like, fuck, how am I going to pay the mortgage? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I would not change it for a blinking second, like not one doubt. No, best yeah. choice I've ever made. I am so I am so with you on that. I've read that. Um, have you read that Martha Graham quote? It's one of the best quotes I've ever read about kind of the choice to live a creative life. Um because I'm exactly like, you know, what you're saying about it's not a bed of roses, you know, there have been some real lows as well as some real highs, you know, that really resonates with me. So, you know, when you see people from your old life and they're like, oh, are you happy? And you're like, oh, I don't know. It's not that simple. Like some days I'm euphoric. Some days I'm crying on the kitchen floor. Like, I But this quote, she she basically talks about being more alive. It's just by living this life, we are more alive. And sometimes that's wonderful sometimes it's really really hard but it's the right choice and it's the choice to be more alive than you otherwise would have been and I just thought yes that's that's what it is there's a there's a couple of things for me like when I first left because I did hate my job and I hated everything about it and I was very very crushed and so I cried every day that I for the first six months after I left the oh, day so job I cried with joy like okay. I was so <laughs> grateful I mean yeah. literally it was gratitude I mean I I would just break down in the middle of like fucking Tesco's doing the food shop oh, wow. because I was doing it in the middle of the day and I was so utterly utterly grateful um that I was free and then and then like over time it does get hard and it's a different taste when you're crying because it's so hard. Um, but one of the things, funny enough, that I have, I literally, it turned up yesterday and I started yesterday. And one of the things that I wanted to do is there's this great quote, and I don't know who says it, but it goes, remember when everything you have today is everything that you wanted, right? And it's yeah. like the reminder yeah. to be grateful for what we have. So I brought a five-year diary um, and I started yesterday and I am trying to write down like three good things that happen every day, like so that maybe not this year, but as I come to the next year, I'm just going to see that every single day I have wins or, yeah. you know, I have had a, an achievement or some some piece of joy just to try and remind me to be grateful Um and yeah, and and to never, ever, ever forget that joy that I felt those first six months of having left the day job. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I completely understand what I you're saying. I think that sounds very wise. I think it's it's all too easy when it gets difficult to forget kind of quite how, <laughs> quite well, how we've come. it was before. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you for your time today. Would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books, your services, like anything else that you'd like to add? Oh, yes. OK, so, yeah, my website is anacaigcoms.co.uk. So Anna Cage is C-A-I-G. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find the sign up to my mailing list. If you'd like to stay up to date with everything I'm doing, opportunities to work with me, I will share information about any workshops, courses, events that I'm doing. And also, if you'd like to work with me one to one, um, that's where to get in touch. Um, I'm also on Instagram most often, really. So that's probably the platform at Anna Keg where I spend most of my time at the moment. Amazing. Well, a giant thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black, you are listening to Anna Cake, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast.
That's it for today's episode, but I'm now going to play you a short clip from my brand new audiobook, A Game of Hearts and Heists. If you like spicy fantasy romance, this is going to be for you. Next week, I'll be joined by my new writing buddy, Cara Clare, and we'll be talking all about how to write reverse harem and a little bit about how we're writing so fucking fast. There are two things I love, winning and angry women. If the two happen to fall together and I win or seduce an angry woman, well, I'll let you work it out. The problem is women, and angry ones in particular, never quite play fair, which is precisely the case for my current angry woman plaything, Quinn Adams, resident new Imperium medic. She's more commonly known in my circles for her vicious skills with poison. She's also a royal pain in my ass. Our tete-a-tete started a few years ago, though if you ask her whether she's trying to screw me over, she'd hang before she confessed. She is, though. Trust me. Sterling, my beloved but irritating twin sister, kicks her legs up on the outdoor table of our favourite bar as she slaps on a cocktail we can't afford, which also happens to be Quinn's fault, but I'll get to that later. I sip my reluctantly purchased coffee. We could only afford one cocktail between us and Sterling won the toss. But I guess it's not all bad. The afternoon sun reflects off the table. Warmth kissing my skin, the sweet stench of booze and baked goods filling the street. Then I glance at Sterling. Must you? I ask. Oh, definitely, Sterling says and ogles the waitress walking inside the bar. The server has an impossibly small waist and tits for days, exactly Sterling's type. I lean back in my chair, wondering where Sterling gets the attitude. While I might love the game of chasing women, I'm much subtler than her. I'm more of a power play girl, games of dominance and submission, winner takes all. Speaking of winning, Quinn, the poisoner, appears at the end of the street. It's those evergreen eyes and crow-coloured curls I spot fast. Her hair is as twisted as her heart, Of course, I turn away, pretend the sun has blinded me and glance through the bar window, as if I'd let the poisoner think I was staring at her. Doesn't seem to matter, though. Normally, she won't deign to give me attention in public. But today, I can sense her gaze raking over me. Thank you, assassin training. I can play her like this all fucking day. I still my breathing... Let my periphery vision work, my hearing stretch, my skin prickle with the vibrations of her movement through the air. If you weren't paying attention, you'd have missed the flicker of her eyes to mine. It was fast, not long enough for anyone else to notice. But I did. The nanosecond of heat on my arms and neck as her gaze skirts over my body, the hiss and bubble of her anger, her lust... Absolutely glorious. One nil to me, poisoner. This is the game between us. She wants to kill me as much as she wants to fuck me, and much to my disdain, the feeling's mutual. The poisoner kicks her chin a little higher, walks a little quicker, her piss-poor attempt at snubbing me. I smirk, pitiful. Are you quite finished? Sterling says, glaring at me as she sips her cocktail. The waitress makes another pass as she delivers drinks to another outside table. She tarts at Sterling as she passes, but she also cooks her head, giving Sterling an eyeful of cleavage. Unbelievable. I have to physically suppress an eye roll. This is how it's going to go. Sterling is going to make eyes at the waitress for the duration of our drink. Then she'll slap the last mouthfuls of cocktail, kick back the chair, slip to the counter, and convince the waitress she needs something from the kitchen. They'll sidle outside, and Sterling will finger-fuck the poor girl into a leg-quivering orgasm, and I will have to hear the sordid details all afternoon. It's tiresome. And no, I'm not 
not jealous. Probably. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.